All right, the title of the sermon this morning is Why We Must Preach the Gospel. Why We Must Preach the Gospel. I think our anniversary is a great day to remember why our church exists and why nine years ago uh, we, were, we were sent out from Lighthouse Baptist Church to plant a church originally in Punchbowl. We ended up moving to Liverpool. But even though we've moved locations and we've changed our name, over the years, our purpose and our mission has remained the same. And I've written it up there so we can be reminded of it every time uh, we come to church. It's to preach the gospel. It's the Great Commission. And that's what we saw there in Matthew 28. Now, the Great Commission is mentioned in all four gospels. John 20, it says here, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. See, so when people get saved, they believe on Jesus Christ, their sins are remitted. And we take part in that by how? Preaching them the gospel, helping them to get saved. Luke 24, 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. So what was the baptism of repentance? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. Mark 16, 15, more, more famous ones. The ones in John and Luke are, are not so famous. Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 18, and that's the one we just read this morning. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So, the Great Commission is mentioned in all four Gospels. It's the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. You know, people's famous, their last words. You know, people tend to take note of people's last words. And what was Jesus' last words before he left his disciples? It was, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was the Great Commission. So the Great Commission ought to be the mission of every church. It's the mission of our church. And you don't want to turn the Great Commission, what, into the Great Omission. Because in the Christian life, that's what happens with the Great Commission. It becomes the one thing they're not doing, right? Because it takes work. It's a lot of hard work. You know, prayer takes a lot of faith, but it doesn't take much boldness, does it? Because you do it in, in the closet. But soul winning does take boldness, right? Because you have to talk to people that you don't know. You have to be, put yourself out there. And that's why often it gets neglected. So we're going to talk about three reasons why we must preach the gospel. First reason is we are commanded to preach the gospel. We just saw the Great Commission in each of the four gospels. So not reason number one why we must preach the gospel because we are all commanded to preach the gospel. The gospel preaching the gospel is not an optional activity. It's not an optional ministry. It is the responsibility of every believer. Right? And it's not only for disciples or church leaders because people say, oh, it's just for the disciples at the time. It's just for church leaders. No. Let's look at the example of Paul. 2 Corinthians 5. Look at how Paul speaks about himself in 2 Corinthians. He says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. See, as he says, is he given to me? No, he's saying it's given to us because he's talking to all the Corinthians. He's including himself. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay, now then we. See, he doesn't say now then I am an ambassador for Christ. 
He's including all the Corinthians as well. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So this is Paul, how Paul thought of himself. He thought of himself as an ambassador. He was, you know, a minister of reconciliation to try and reconcile people back to God. Look at what he says here in 1 Corinthians 9. You know, would to God that all God's people had this attitude when it came to the Great Commission, preaching the gospel. He says here in verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. You see, we're talking about this morning why we must preach the gospel. It's commanded. It's it's necessary for us to. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. We should be concerned with what God thinks about us if we are not preaching the gospel. Like Paul was here saying, hey, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I'm commanded. It's necessary. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Look at how Paul had that burden, had that necessity. You know, he said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And how he strived to connect with all different people, whether or not they were Jews or Gentiles, and, and, and what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 9. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker thereof with you. So people think, well, you know, preaching the gospel, that ministry, that's just for the apostles, those appointed to preach. Well, look at Paul's example, right? Paul is saying, hey, he's a soul winner. Does anyone have any question that Paul is a soul winner, that Paul made it the primary mission of his life? preach the gospel and to get other people saved? Nobody would question that, right? So then look at what Paul says to the believers. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard, and look at this, and seen in me. So you see how he's not teaching them to do something that he's not. He's saying, hey, the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen me do, you do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So is the Great Commission only for apostles and church leaders and those in ministry? No. He is saying to every believer, hey, I want the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. 1 Corinthians 11. Look at what Paul says here. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So does it look like Paul here is expecting, you know what, don't worry, guys, I got this. I'm going to go preach the gospel. You guys just support me. No, it sounds like Paul is exhorting the church at Corinth, at Philippi, and all these churches to say, look, we are ambassadors We need to preach the gospel, do the things that I do, because all of us have to be following Jesus like I'm following Jesus. And then we go even to Matthew 4, when Jesus called his disciples. Look at what he says to them. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, look at this, follow me, and I will make you fishes of men and they straightway left their nets and followed him so what does it mean to follow jesus he's saying follow me i will make you fishes of men paul said follow me as i follow christ he was a fisher of men so what does that tell you we need to become fishers of men we need to sing that 
You know, action song. Yeah, come along to Kids Club. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. If you want, follow me. Oh, I'll stop it there. I know it's enough singing for you guys. You've got to follow Jesus. You know, if you're not a fisher of men, you know, maybe it's because you're not following Jesus. Acts 2. Acts 2. Now, preaching the gospel is not just for the men, is it? It's not just for the men. It's for the ladies as well. Acts 2, 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Look at this. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So you see, if preaching the gospel was only for men, why on the day of Pentecost, when God gave them the gift of tongues, he poured out their spirit, he poured it out both on men and women. Why? Because he wants both men and women preaching the gospel. It's not just for men also. For men only. Philippians 4.3 And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me, look at this, in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow labourers whose names are in the book of life. So preaching the gospel is not only for men, it's for women also. You know, women, it's not good enough to say, my husband goes soul winning for me. My husband does the soul winning for our family. That's not you fulfilling the Great Commission, doing your part. You also need to be a soul winner. You need to be a fisher of men as well. Why is that? Right? Why is it so important? It's not just about ticking a box. You know, I've done my spiritual duty. Why is it so important that everyone is a fisher of men? Because everyone connects with different people differently. Female, male, you know, there's two genders, right? So there's no other genders to connect with. So don't worry about the other genders, male or female. You know, and then you have old and young, you know, different cultural backgrounds as well. The more different people that become fishers of men, the more effective the church can be at reaching all these different people. That's why it's so important that everyone is involved. You know, we've got to make sure, men, we've got to make sure we give our wife an opportunity. You know, this is why. You see... I'm trying to set the example. You know, why do Elizabeth and I rotate? Because I want to make sure Elizabeth also gets the opportunity to go preaching. So that's why one week I look after the children, she goes, and the other week she looks after the children, and I go. And we just make sure, you know, we are all participating in this important ministry. So it's a commandment, first of all, why we must preach the gospel. So if we are not preaching the gospel, we're in sin. You know, isn't that what sin is? Sin is transgression of the law. Sin is when God's commanded something and we don't do it. So if we're not participating in the Great Commission, we are in sin. Second reason why we must preach the gospel, second reason why we must preach the gospel is because hell is a real place. Hell is a real place. Luke 16, we'll read this story here of a man that went to hell. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us 
that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You know, such a sad story uh, in Luke 16 of the rich man that went to hell. We learn a, a lot of things from this passage. One is, hell is real. You know, it's, it's not a parable. You know, this is not a parable. Some people try and explain this story away as a parable, and it doesn't make sense. First of all, you know, if it's a parable, why does the beggar have a name? You don't have a parable and then say this beggar's name is Lazarus, a specific person. Abraham as well is in this story, and he's, not, he, he's an actual person as well. So how is this a parable? If you've got Abraham, you've got Lazarus. Now, even if it is a parable, think about what a parable is. A parable uses something that is real to describe a spiritual truth. Think about it, the parable of the sower. There is such thing as a seed, as a sower, as shoots that spring up, as fruit. These things are real. So he's giving real things to teach something else. So we have this story in Luke, even if they, we give them, okay, well, let's say it's a parable. Well, it's using hell as something to teach this parable. So hell must be real. What else do we see in this passage? We see in this passage that as soon as the, as the rich man died, there was no middle ground. There was no purgatory. There's no middle place. He died, and then it says here, um, I can't, I'll, 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 here in verse 23, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. So there's no middle place. He died, he opened his eyes, and he was burning in hell. Why? Because it was, was it because he was worse than anyone else? No, it was because he did not believe on Jesus Christ. That's why people go to hell. They do not accept the grace through Jesus Christ. Now the last thing we learn from this passage, and I think what is most profound about this story that Jesus tells about the rich man that went to hell, is we get insight into the mind of somebody that is in hell. And you'll notice, what is it? First of all, he realizes he's in torment. And when he realizes he cannot get out, what's his next thought? I don't want anyone else to go here. Right? He's not, they're not in hell just hating on God. You know, yeah, maybe they'll hate on God for the first couple of seconds. Right? And when they realize they're there, burning in hell, in torment, they're going to be hoping to get out, and they don't want anyone else going there. So that's what we have to reflect on when we read this passage, is hell is such a terrible place that not even the people in hell want people to go there. Right? And if we know hell exists, we shouldn't want people to go there either. So a question for us this morning, do you believe hell is real? Is Jesus lying about hell? I mean, look at what Jesus said about hell. Mark 9, 47. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So if hell is not a real place, why would Jesus be warning us about a fictitious place? It's because it's not fictitious. Hell exists. It's a terrible place. We learn about it in Luke 16. And if people do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's where they're going. Now we have an opportunity on this earth and we are commanded like we saw in the first point. We have an opportunity to change people's minds so that they don't go to this place of torment. That was the desire of the rich man in hell. Is that your desire? Because if you believe hell is real, and you know that there is one way out of hell, Jesus Christ, and you keep that knowledge to yourself, what sort of Christian are we? You know, what sort of Christians are we if we know the truth? We know that hell is real, 
we know that there is only one way out of hell, and yet we just go about our lives just trying to build up wealth, trying to live for pleasure, you know? What sort of Christians are we? That's not the reason why we're here. The reason why we are here, like we talked about in the beginning, is the Great Commission. And it's not just because God wants us to keep us busy, it's because it matters to the eternal life of people that we talk to. So number two reason why we must preach the gospel is because hell is a real place. Now let's talk about the third reason. Third reason why we must preach the gospel is because of eternal life. There are rewards. This is the last one we talk about because this is the one that, you know, for, for no other reason you preach the gospel, you know, preach the gospel to invest in your eternity, right? When we die and we go on unto eternal life, what is your eternal life going to be like? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. Now, this is an analogy that is given of our life and our works. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. So, it's giving the picture here that our life, our works, we are building a building. Right? Now, the foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, this is the type of material that you can build on this building. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So what is the analogy here? The analogy here is we have the foundation, Jesus Christ, we have some materials to work with, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now, what is the difference between these materials? Some are combustible and some are not. So what is this referring to? This is saying when you do things for God, you are either building on this foundation things that will last for eternity and things that won't. So what are some examples of things that don't last for an eternity? Or well, the Bible says, you know, everything will, be, will go away. Everything that you can see. The Bible says the things that are seen are temporary. Isn't that a profound thought? That every single thing that you can see with your eyes will not go into eternity. Just think about that for a moment. Every single thing that you see with your eyes, that does not go into eternity. So... The analogy here is we're building on this foundation. Our works are going to be put on this foundation and then it's going to be tried by fire. So think about for yourself. You know, let's just imagine for a moment, you know, your foundation. And you think about all the things that you accomplish in your life. Is it something that you can see or is it things you can't see? Are you putting on there precious stone, gold, silver, precious stone, or are you putting on there wood, hay, and stubble? And then come at the end, just imagine now just fire just goes through that, works. What's left? What's left on your foundation? That's why we must preach the gospel. Because how do we build upon our foundation gold, silver, and precious stones? We preach the gospel. We get people saved. Ecclesiastes 7. The Bible says here, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. This is a good passage to reflect on when we think about eternity. You know that, that thought experiment where people, the thought experiment where people will say, if today was your last day to live, would you live it differently? Because why? That makes you reflect on the brevity of life, it makes you reflect on death, and it makes you realize that you're not going to be around here forever. What are you going to do with your life? So I want you to just imagine, you know, well, as we get older, we, we attend more funerals. But you know, when you go to a funeral, just 
put yourself back there for a moment, like this verse is saying. It's good for your heart to be in the house of mourning. You know, imagine you're at a funeral. What are you thinking when you're at a funeral? I remember when I went to my grandmother's funeral. You know, you, you, you walk up to the casket, you see the lifeless body in there, and you know that person's not there anymore. You know, they're somewhere else. But you look at the lifeless body and you think to yourself, you know, one day that's going to be me lying in there, lifeless. You know, my body's going to be in there. And it reminds you, you know, one day my life's going to be over. What is my life about? And then you sit there at the funeral and people talk about the person's life. And it makes you reflect, you know, I wonder what people are going to say about me when, my, when I'm gone. But you know what I'm more concerned about when I think about my life? I think about what is God going to say about my life? Because I think that's so much more important, what God thinks about my life in the grand scheme of eternity than what man thinks about my life. You know, man might have thought, you know, you wasted your life, you, know, you spent your time going to church and doing all these things, but that doesn't concern me. What should concern us is what God thinks about our life. So do you think about that? When we bring our mind there, what do you think is going to matter at the end of our life? Let's think of one more scenario. One more scenario I just want to bring your minds to. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So the last scenario I want you to think about is the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment. Now just imagine we're standing at the white throne judgment. Heaven and earth has just passed away. Everything that we've worked hard for and you know, we've slogged our guts out for has now, like the Bible says here, all been dissolved. You know, we're standing at the white throne judgment. I imagine it's like the Matrix, right? It's, just empty, it's, just, it's all white. And we're all just standing there before God. What do you think you're going to be thinking in that moment? You know, when all the stuff that we've worked so hard for, that we, you know, we value, and you know, our houses, and our cars, and our gadgets, and things we love for, it's all disappeared. Now we're standing before God, it's just souls in the white throne judgment. What do you think is going to matter at that point? I have a feeling what's going to matter is who else is here with me? You're going to look around. And you're going to see maybe the people you know. And the books are going to be opened. And you're going to see people who are not written in the book of life, cast into the lake of fire. Are you going to be thinking at that time, man, I just wish I had just spent another Sunday just working a little bit harder. I wish I had just, you know, went on just one more holiday and needed that rest, you know. You know, I wish I had just played, you know, just watched one more, you know, movie. You're not going to be thinking of those things, all the things that we spend our time on now. You know what you're going to be thinking? I wish I just spent a bit more time getting just one more person saved. <clears throat> it reminds me a bit, and I didn't have this in my notes, but doesn't it, doesn't it remind you of that movie, Schindler's List? Have you guys watched Schindler's List? And he, he saved a lot of the Jews, you know, a few Jews, but he still lived a very lavish lifestyle. And I sometimes think we can reflect on that in our life. That, yeah, maybe we preach the gospel, we've gotten some people saved here and there, but we still live quite a comfortable life. And it makes you wonder at the end of it, like the point I'm making here, you know, in Oscar Schindler, when all the war was over. Did you guys remember the end of that movie? He said his car, this could have been two more people. This ring, this watch, it could have been three more people. And he realized, you know, he could have done so much more for God. And I think that's what's going to happen 
when we face God. We're not going to be thinking about all the experiences in this life that we missed out on, all the things that we didn't get to enjoy. We're going to wish that we spent more time preaching the gospel, getting that one more person saved. So in closing, I want you to think about what's the only thing from this world that you can bring to heaven with you? This is the question I ask people when I get them saved out to try and encourage them to preach the gospel as well. What's the one thing you can bring into the next life? You can't bring any material possessions. The one thing you can bring is other people. So if the one thing you can bring into the next life is other people, that is what we should be focusing on. So let's close on this passage here in Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. All right, let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you for your word. We just pray, Lord, that you'll use each and every one of us uh, Lord, this uh, time on earth is so short. Every time we uh, celebrate an anniversary, we're reminded that our life is fleeting. So I pray, Lord, that you will use each and every person here to do great things for you, use them to serve you, and help us, Lord, to win souls to Jesus Christ. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.